Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we will be discussing and investigating some of the aspects of shear. We will be looking at how uh, shear arises from external forces uh, placed on a structure or an element. Uh, we will be uh, considering the uh, various directionality implications of shear and how uh, shear in one direction produces shear forces in many directions. And then we'll be touching on uh, how shear forces distribute within the cross section of a beam, as well as some uh, unique uh, implications of the directionality of shear, in particular in wood design and in concrete design. So last week we looked at axial forces. We introduced uh, tension and compression. We just, or not last week, last session, I should say. Last session we discussed uh, uh, axial forces. We looked at shear, uh, we, oh my God. One of those mornings, apparently. <laughs> anyway, uh, last session we looked at axial forces, we looked at tension and compression, we considered buckling, uh, we considered local and global buckling and some of the uh, intricacies therein. Today though, we're gonna consider, we're going to continue our look at basic forces, um, basic internal forces by looking at shear forces. So the topic du jour for today is shear. Now, uh, mapping, if, we're, if we want to map out our, um, let's, let's look a little global, uh, look a little broader at uh, the type of internal forces that can appear in a member. Uh, so internal forces. Well, we have our axial forces. This is your tension and compression. We've looked at those. Then there's also shear, which we're looking at today. So that's the topic for today, primarily. Uh, then we also have moment, which is intimately tied together with shear, if you remember your mechanics, and also your statics. And if we have, to, depending on how much we want to go over and what we need to look at in shear, uh, we may look at a bit at moment today as well. And then um, we have uh, there are some other ones as well. There's torsion, although we're not going to focus on that one in this class. Uh, in this course, we're focused primarily on the three classical structural analysis uh, internal member forces, which are axial shear and moment. And we'll be looking at uh, various techniques as we move along of finding these forces within various kinds of frames, versus, uh, both determinate and indeterminate frames. So. And again, I would uh, classify these as internal forces. And they, uh, and, uh, internal forces are of course pro uh, produced from external forces. We have all of our external forces that are applied to a frame or a structure. And these external forces are the things that we've looked at before, like uh, live load, dead load, and also environmental loading, like snow load, wind load, uh, rain load, seismic load, etc. The external loads, uh, the external forces and, uh, act on a building, and depending on the geometry and properties of the structure, they in turn produce internal forces. So we've looked at external forces broadly, and now we are uh, discussing internal forces. And within our, uh, within our internal forces, we're going to be looking at axial, shear, and moment. We've already considered axial, and now we're looking at shear today. Okay, so that's kind of a roadmap for this portion of the course. So shear, what is shear? Well, Let's think about this uh, intuitively. Let's look at an everyday understanding. And I'm gonna start at the most primitive basics with a very crudely drawn pair of scissors. We sometimes refer to scissors as shear. Why is this? Well, uh, if you zoom in on, if you, look at, if you look at a pair of scissors edgewise, they're constructed of two blades and they, of course, operate by closing the handle, bringing it down, and uh, sandwiching material between uh, these two blades. Uh, simple, great, literal, liter literal elementary school stuff. 
So shear, therefore, is the, so, and, and again, these are for, sometimes you know, we usually call these scissors, but sometimes also people refer to them as shears, and that is not surprising. If you have an element, like so, uh, axial force would be like this, of course. If you have uh, forces pulling or compressing the along the axis of a member, that will be your axial force, tension or compression. But if you have a force perpendicular to the axis of the member, we refer to that as shear. Um, upward, downward shear as such uh, in a free body diagram, that sort of thing. And again, though, this is just definitional. So this is fun. That's fundamentally at a very, very basic intuitive level what shear is. But we want to know, uh, we want to consider it at a deeper level. So shear again, fundamentally, we consider it the uh, we consider it the force that occurs perpendicular to the axis of a member. In terms of basic definition, although there are some very important caveats and subtleties to this. All right, so let's take a look at shear and introduce it a bit and look at some of the directionality of shear on a beam. So let's say we have a beam. And we'll just go ahead and say this is a simply supported beam. And let's say we have a distributed load applied across the top of it. Just a nice uniform distributed load. And then we're going to cut it at some location and I'll just go ahead and call this location A. So we're going to cut this at A here. And because of the distributed load, we would have some reactions. And we would have, uh, we could have a, uh, we of course could have a horizontal translational force reaction on our pin support. But because this is a, uh, because this is a assembly supported beam with uh, just a vertical load across, there will be, uh, that reaction will have zero magnitude. Okay, so we've, imagine we cut this beam at A and then we isolate that piece. So let's isolate that piece and look at a sectioned free body diagram. So let's uh, section this free body diagram and, and this would just be, again, just the portion of the beam from the reaction to A. So we have point A here. And then we have our distributed load across. And when we cut the beam, certain internal forces are released, or revealed, I should say. Released is something very different that we saw uh, previously. Okay, so there would be, there could be, although this in this case it will be zero, there could be an internal force that we could designate with either a P or an N. So I could have like a PA here. Now, uh, shear. In terms of sign convention on shear, if we have a element, we will typically uh, put a downward arrow on the right hand side of an element like this. And uh, then we'd also have a moment. So in terms of uh, sign convention on shear, if you have an element, like the element of a beam here, the piece of a beam, a small, a small uh, section of a beam's length, uh, we will call anything that has that produces shear like this with a downward arrow on the right and an upward arrow on the left. This is positive shear. And uh, if you're curious, moment is po uh, anything that produces positive curvature, which looks like this on an element like this. Okay, so again, we have uh, if, we, if we cut our beam at some location along its length, uh, we'll end up with a downward pointing arrow here and then a uh, the upward pointing reaction on the side and then um, we'll have uh, we, again by definition we call anything any shear element that has a downward pointing arrow on the right hand side and a leftward pointing arrow on the uh, left hand side we refer to that as positive shear now um, and so now whether there would actually exist downward or upward shear in this uh, 
A uh, particular location would depend on the, depend on exa where exactly it is. I mean, whether it's upward or downward would depend on where precisely we cut it along the beam's length, as well as the nature of the distributed load and some other things. But in terms of sign convention, if we have, uh, we have to define, uh, we have to define something for positive shear and we have to define something for positive moment. In fact, I should put a little positive M here for moment. Uh, we have to define something as positive and something as negative. And for shear, we define anything that has a downward pointing arrow on the right and an upward pointing shear arrow on the left as positive shear. Note, it's not about whether they point upward or downward. Um, on a on a small shear element like this, and this is this meaning a portion of a beam. Uh, if you have a downward pointing arrow on the right hand side of the element, that is a uh, and then and then in turn you have a upward pointing arrow on the left hand side, that is positive shear. And in contrast, negative shear is the opposite. So negative shear like this and you would have a downward pointing arrow on the left hand side and an upward pointing arrow on the right hand side. And then in terms of curvature, for a moment, you would have the opposite as well. And we'll see this more when we get into moment next lecture. Okay, also uh, because of this directionality, um, something interesting happens when we take a look at a small differential element. And Again, hopefully this is a review from mechanics, but imagine we take a small differential element like this. So now, uh, so these diagrams again were uh, a cut, were a cut section of an entire beam. This is just going to be a small differential element, small enough that we can treat the shear on the left and the shear on the right as constant. So let's take this here and actually I'll make it a little bigger so we can see things a little bit more clearly. So let's say we have a, a differential element now, um, again, uh, if we assume positive shear, I'll have a downward pointing shear arrow here. And okay, so I have a downward pointing arrow here. And then if I do a summation of forces in the vertical direction, I can conclude that there must be an upward pointing shear arrow here. Then in turn, if I have a, um, so in terms of translational equilibrium, this thing is now in equilibrium. It is not going anywhere if I only look at a sum of forces in the horizontal or the vertical direction. However, what happens if I take a balance of moments, say about its center? If I do that, well in turn, I'll have um, two uh, forces, each which will want to produce a counter or a clockwise rotation, negative moment. And so I need, so basically these, I have equal and opposite forces separated by a distance. I have a couple. And so uh, without any other uh, forces present, this differential element is going to go into rotation, which is not what happens in real elements. So what I need to do is I need to add an opposing set of forces that will force this into rotational equilibrium. And those will look like this. So from the perspective of a small differential element, this in turn is positive shear, while the opposite would be negative shear. Again, we assume that uh, just just in terms of convention, it is it is entirely arbitrary whether we call this positive shear or this positive shear. But when uh, discussing shear and moment, we have to define something as positive, and this is the sign convention that is commonly used and we'll be using in this course. So uh, negative shear. Uh, essentially, all of the forces would just be flipped in their directions. So this would be negative, or this would be pointing upward. This would be pointing to the right, uh, this would be pointing uh, downward, and this would be pointing to the left. And that is a basic description of sign conventions uh, for uh, shear elements, both with beams and with uh, small differential elements. And this does have certain implications as we will uh, see as we move through the lecture. So next I want to consider briefly how shear is carried in a beam. So how is shear stress carried within a beam, within the cross section of the beam? So again, let's say we have a beam of some sort. 
And uh, I suppose, let's say it's a W section. So I'm going to add some flanges to this drawing, like here and here. So I have a beam, and uh, it's going to have some uh, downward load applied to it, which will produce shear. So how are shear forces carried? Well, shear forces are carried. Um, we, and we did briefly mention this previously when we talked about um, when we talked about how both moment and shear are distributed within a beam, but I did want to uh, refresh things a little bit. So if you have, for example, a, well, I should, before this, in order for this to make sense, I should probably first uh, list the primary formula for uh, shear forces within a uh, beam's cross section. And that formula, if you remember, tau, uh, tau for shear stress is VQ over IT. VQ over IT, uh, where Q is your first moment of outward, okay, where V is your shear force at a point, tau being your shear stress, uh, Q, I will talk about that briefly, the first moment of outward area. Uh, I is your entire section moment of inertia. Uh, moment of inertia, I'll just put M O E. And then uh, T is the thickness. At the depth you're considering. Uh, at the depth you're calculating. So let's see what this means. Let's see what each of these terms mean. For this, we'll need to consider a W section. And I'm going to simplify and draw this as just a series of rectangles. So let's say you want to calculate, uh, and so shear, just like moment, is going to be a function of depth in a beam. Uh, depending on where you take the shear, the shear stress will vary. So like here, here, etc. Then um, here, let's see, uh, VQ over IT. V um, is your shear force found by shear and bending moment diagrams and also for, through, uh, through uh, broader frame structural analysis processes. Q, the first moment of outward area. What does that mean? Well, let's say I'm cutting right here. Let's say, or let's say I want to know the shear stress here at point A. Let's call this point A. Well, you have to imagine cutting the beam at that location and considering this shape, uh, the shape in the outward direction. Again, in the outward direction. And when I say outward, what I mean by that is looking um, where you are in the beam, if you're cutting here, you're going to go in the direction that takes you closest to the exterior. For example, if you're here, you'll be looking um, towards the closest direction that takes you uh, to the exterior of the beam. And so that would be up here uh, in this case. So, um, and how you calculate this, if you, let's say you have this point, um, here's point A, and let's say there are centroidal distances D1, and an area A1, and then a centroidal distance from that point, 
D2 with an area A2. Well, the first moment of outward area, this Q, is simply going to be D1 times A1 plus D2 times A2, the first moment of outward area. Um, and if you, you know, that should look familiar. That kind of formula is useful when calculating uh, centroids of shapes. If I wanted to find the centroid of this entire shape, all it, once I have this, all I would have to do is divide by the total area of it. Now I get the distance from the cut, uh, the centroidal distance from the cut for that centroid. But anyway, so again, this is for a bit of a review from basic mechanics. That's the first moment of outward area. I know I'm going through this very fairly quickly, but this is just meant to be a brief uh, refresher discussing in general a topic of shear. So if we cut uh, A here, again, the first moment of outward area to determine what to determine which direction we look, we say, okay, are we, uh, which direction brings us, uh, brings us to the exterior surface first? And when we're right here, the closest distance is up here. And uh, so we calculate, we, so we cut out this shape here, the shape uh, between the cut and the exterior surface, and we calculate the first moment of outward area therein. I, this is simply going to be the moment of inertia of the entire shape, and T is the thickness. Uh, so at this, if you're, if you're cutting at uh, A here, the thickness would be this distance, the thickness of the web. Um, but if you were cutting, let's say you're cutting at a point B here, here the thickness would be the entire uh, width of the flange. Here, if you're cutting at, if you're ca calculating the shear stress at B, if you're calculating tau b, for example, uh, that would lead to that the uh, thickness, the thickness for b would just be equal to the flange width of the entire uh, section. Again, it's the it's the thickness where thickness is just, is really defined as the perpendicular the, the, the perpendicular thickness. The thickness if shear is coming down, the thickness of the element in the direction perpendicular to that in the cross section. Okay, so. That's a very brief, very rapid introduction to the non-uniform shear formula, but uh, then let's consider how this actually results in shear stresses distributing through a member, through the cross-section of a member. So that, uh, that T term is going to be very important because think about this for a second, that VQ over IT, when your um, T is larger, your, uh, your shear stresses therefore will decrease. When your T is wider, your shear forces, uh, well, sorry, when your shear is wider, your, your uh, shear stresses will decrease. And when it's narrower, your shear stresses will increase. And that creates some very interesting behavior um, for a cross section when under shear. So again, let's look at a W section, something like this. And again, I'm going to rewrite this uh, ta equals VQ over IT, just so we have this as a discussion reference. Yeah. And the T is going to be the important part here for this discussion. Again, ta, the shear stress, tau, ta. Um, ta, again, if uh, T, it, T determines is a core determiner uh, of the shear stress. When T is large, ta is small. When, thick, when the thickness is narrow, uh, the, uh, and in turn, when the thickness is narrow, the shear stresses are large. So what that means is that somewhere like a uh, in the flange of a beam, where you have a very wide thickness in this context, you're going to end up with very slight shear stresses, very small shear stresses. And then in the web, when your thickness is very small, you're going to have uh, very high shear stresses. And then also Q is, Q also, so though 
again, let's just break this down. T, uh, small t or small t. Let's just write this down to gather some thoughts. Small t equals uh, high shear stress ta. And large t, small ta, small shear stress or low shear stress. Then Q, and again, uh, let's think about where these, these thicknesses are. So you have a, a small thickness, a very small measure of thickness in the web. And you have a large thickness in the flange, in the flanges. Q, first moment of outward area. Well, mathematically, how does this work? So Q, if you're, uh, again, just looking at the formula, a large Q is going to be a uh, large ta, large shear stress, and a small Q will be a small ta, a small shear stress, and again, let's think about where these uh, occur. A large uh, Q, a large first moment of outward area, first moment of outward area is going to increase uh, directly, or not directly, it's going to increase uh, generally as you go into a member from the outside, uh, from the upward surface downward or from the downward surface upward. And so the, uh, the Q is going to be smallest in the flanges because there's less uh, outward area to calculate a first molar outward area. Not flangest, flanges. And then the large Q is going to be at the web. So we see that, bo that both of these terms, both, or I should say all of, both of our geometric terms here, the Q and the T, uh, contribute to there being large shear stresses in the uh, web and small shear stresses in the flanges. Now, um, so again, Q and T both contribute to the same exact uh, general behavior. Uh, v is a constant across the cross section. Again, V is just the overall shear uh, value uh, for an entire cross section in a beam, so that's not gonna vary with depth. And then I is also a property of the entire cross section. It's the moment of inertia of the entire thing. And put, so uh, the only parts that are going to vary with depth within a beam are the Q and the T. And from this, this is how we can produce our, uh, the plot that we're gonna go over next, which is the overall distribution of shear forces, uh, or sure, I, should, I should say shear stresses in a uh, section. Okay, so let's look at this. So we've looked at the components of shear, of the general shear equation, she, or I should say shear stress equation, looking at the variation of shear stress with depth. And now let's put all this together. So let's put this together now. And let's see. So let's consider this W section again. Actually, I could probably just draw it right here and then I'm thinking about this, but we'll have a clear board for later. So let's look at how shear stresses vary within the depth of a member. Ta as a function of depth. So let's say this is our zero shear line. Well, what you'll get is very slight stresses um, in the flange. Then you'll get a sudden jump as the thickness of the uh, member decreases as you go into the web. And the same thing 
down here. And then also the same increase for the bottom flange. And then you'll have a parabolic relationship here as well. So I, in, in my head, I sometimes refer to this as the sheer tombstone or something like that. Didn't, in my head, this always looked like a tombstone. So I can say, I, I sometimes in my head are just in casual parlance refer to this as the sheer tombstone. But uh, hopefully that's not a metaphor for the course exam or something. But uh, anyway, so <laughs> we see that our, um, our shear stresses again are minimal, are actually zero on the outer surface, on the outermost fiber, your shear stresses are zero. They are still slight in the flanges. They jump when you go from the flange to the web and they reach an absolute maximum point at the center for a, well, at the center for a uh, doubly symmetric section for, or for, I should say for a symmetric section. Otherwise that will occur at the neutral axis. Anyway, so we have our V max right here. And then it, you would have, but then you can also have a, so the, so we have a maximum shear value, but you also have, uh, we could also calculate a V average if you wish, if, you, if we wished, uh, V bar or V average. And that would just be equal to your, um, uh, that would be equal to, for example, the uh, approximately equal to the shear force. I should probably put ta average and ta max. Sorry about that. Do you want to be consistent here? So let's say you had a ta average and a ta max. So ta uh, average would be uh, just V divided by uh, the area of the web. Okay, so backing up, um, I can write ta is equal to V over A, or at least area of the web. This is the kind of design equation that's used in a lot of uh, a lot of design contexts and methodologies, such as the AISC steel uh, design uh, equations. And what they do is they're saying, okay, um, when they design, uh, when you're calculating the uh, shear strength of a W section, uh, because the flanges contribute so little to shear stress, they actually ignore it, and they just say they define a thing that they define a term, the area of the web where the area of the web is equal to the thickness of the web times the depth of the member. And they just, uh, they kind of model the, uh, the shear stress or the shear capacity of a member of a W section, for example, by just lopping off the flanges and only considering the extended web like so. So that's, uh, and, and because of that, when they do that, they can treat the, uh, the shear stress becomes much more uniform when they do that because they're lopping off the, uh, the, the small portions uh, in the web here, or sorry, in the flanges here. And so they can just use, when, when, in steel design at least, you can just use this average stress approach. But again, that's uh, maybe a bit beyond the scope of this class. Um, the important thing I want you to know is that at least in a W section, be aware of um, how shear stress is distributed with the height of a member and uh, know that it's zero at the flanges and maximal at the center or more technically the neutral axis. Okay. Now this is a lot. It's a bit of review. Hopefully this is uh, looking at, hopefully this is a bit familiar and some review for mechanics, but I just want to, I'm sort of gathering up the, again, uh, in this stage of the course, I'm sort of gathering up the pieces that we'll be using as we look at our uh, more complete frame analysis. So, uh, questions so far? Okay, so let's continue. I want to look at the implication of the uh, shear square or our shear element. I wanna consider some of the implications of that. And it does, ha and how it has real implications uh, for structural design. All right, so let's take a look back at this directionality of shear and see why this is important for uh, structural design purposes. So, as we mentioned, as we just discussed, the um, when you have shear in one direction on an element, it in turn induces shear in four different directions. You have a if we're looking at this from the point of view of shear half errors, that sort of thing. 
And so if you have a downward shear arrow here, you'll need an upward here. And then to keep everything in equilibrium, you need a matching opposed couple uh, to prevent uh, rotational motion of your differential element. However, um, this has some interesting implications for structural design. So let's say you had a beam again. And let's say you have one element here. And again, you have this type of uh, force distribution, shear force distribution on a differential element, like so, as shown here. Also, if you want to consider what the deflected shape of this would look like, well, let's see, it's being pulled outward like this. Um, these together act like this and this. So that point would move inward, that would point would move inward, this would move outward, this would move outward, and you would get a deflected shape, kind of like this. Now, the reason this is important is that um, even though shear is generally a down, or we, we tend to think of shear as a uh, vertically pointing force or pointing in the direction of load, when you have shear on an element, you are uh, on a differential element, plain element like this, you are inevitably going to get uh, shear in the different directions. And while for something like steel, that's fine. There's no uh, complications therein. Um, steel is what's, think about steel. Steel is what we know as uh, homogenous, means it has constant composition throughout, or reasonably close to homogenous, and isotropic. Isotropic meaning that it has the same properties in every direction. So in other words, uh, steel, it doesn't it, in terms of how you apply shear to it, uh, shear doesn't care what direction you apply shear to it. It's going to have the same uh, shear strength regardless of how you apply uh, a force to it. And the reason for that is that steel, if you look in, if you were to zoom in at the microstructure of steel, you would see some crystals going this way, some crystal lattices going this way, some going this way, some going this way, some going this way, some into the page, out of the page, etc. In other words, the microstructure of steel is just a large jumble of crystalline, uh, crystalline formations uh, joined together at with, you know, grain boundaries in arbitrary and random directions. So because of that, there is no preferential direction for a given, if you have a lump of steel, there is no preferential direction for uh, the grain boundaries and grain directions. And as such, it exhibits the same properties in all directions. But that is not true for all materials. Now, from a structural engineering point of view, wood is actually a very fascinating material. And uh, I would encourage you all to take a wood design class if you get the chance at some point. Or hell, multiple wood design classes, why not? They're always great. And the reason uh, lumber, timber, wood, whatever terms you want to use, um, the reason their properties are not the same in all directions is because of how wood grows. Um, now, I don't want to get too deep into the woods. Oh, ha, too deep into the woods. Anyway, uh, too deep into the woods of, uh, well, wood design. But if you think about uh, wood as a material, think about the grain structure. You've probably all held a two by four or something like this in your hands before. And so you know intuitively that wood has a grain structure. And uh, a common analogy used in, um, in wood design context is that wood can, be almost be thought, can almost be thought of as a bundle of straws, where each straw represents a single cell in wood, and the cells in wood are, uh, the way they grow, uh, individual wood cells are much, much longer. They're like 100 times longer than they are uh, across. So what you end up having is these long cells, and they grow, their axis uh, grows along the axis of, well, originally a tree trunk or a tree branch, and they are hollow to allow moisture transport. So you have to imagine, uh, so you have to imagine wood cells as long hollow cylinders and then your um, and then a large chunk of wood or a piece of wood is effectively a bundle of these straws or sticks bound together held together by certain uh, forces um, inter intercellular forces I should say and because of this if I try if I pull on think about it if I pull on this in this direction if I pull in this direction, I'm trying to pull individual straws 
from one another. If this is a wood cell and this is a wood cell, if I pull on it like this, I'm pulling a straw, pulling straws apart. What if I pull on it like this though? If I pull it like that, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to pull in an individual cell into, uh, I'm actually trying to rip apart a single cell or a whole bunch of cells. And so because of this, um, because of this difference in behavior where in some directions you're trying to separate the straws and in some directions you're trying to actually uh, rip them apart, because of this, wood is not isotropic. Wood is not isotropic. And so because of this, uh, in design, you need to consider Uh, shear stress in both directions. And in the context of wood, we refer to this as uh, parallel and perpendicular to grain. Now, in, actually in practice, we only consider the one that controls. But again, remember, shear generates, uh, shear will generate equal forces in all, in, in all four of the perpendicular directions. And because of that, um, again, with steel, it, for, it, with a nice isotropic material like steel, that's not a major problem. Simply because of um, uh, simply because of uh, how steel has uh, the same stress, same strength in all directions. So, if the uh, nature of shear distributes the the, stri the shear stress um, in the perpendicular direction, that's not a problem. However, with something like wood that is not isotropic. You might have your grain lined up nice and perfect to handle shear in uh, the direction that you would uh, expect from a free body, di a global free body diagram or a cut free body diagram. But then sh uh, shear's nature, as it likes to as it, as it will distribute uh, shear forces in all directions, suddenly you're pulling. In, whenever you pull it in the strong direction, you're also pulling in, or I should say, not pulling shearing. When you shear in the strong direction, you're also shearing in the weak direction. So. Again, this is not a wood design class, but that, that this is one interesting uh, case where the uh, shear stress um, uh, distributing in pa the parallel directions is paramount. All right, questions so far? Okay. And finally, I'd like to just briefly mention uh, shear stress in concrete because this also has some implications for concrete design. I want to help us, I want to help us uh, see how concrete beams work. And it, this will connect back to our basic shear discussion. Finally, the directionality of shear has certain implications for reinforced concrete. And if you think to reinforce concrete, uh, think of the design of a reinforced concrete beam. So let's say we have a simply supported reinforced concrete beam. It's going to have longitudinal steel running along the length of the member. And that steel will carry the, uh, large, ten uh, the large tensile forces present in concrete or in a concrete beam. Now, um, if you have positive curvature, say if you have like a, say if you have just a uniform load across the top, this will enter positive curvature, positive bending, the top going into compression, the bottom into tension. And we know that concrete uh, has very high compressive capacity, but it has a uh, very, very low tensile capacity to the point that we can ne simply neglect it in design. Um, so because of this, we need, uh, because concrete cannot carry uh, tensile forces or tensile stresses, we need to have uh, longitudinal steel in the beam uh, to carry the where the uh, to carry the tensile forces that the concrete cannot. The concrete will carry the compression, the steel will carry the tension, and that's the basic idea behind reinforced concrete beams. Now, however, um, and I get usually also would have some top steel, uh, sometimes just for constructability, uh, or if you have negative bending, those will also serve that function. Uh, the same function of providing tensile capacity for the concrete, uh, for the beam. Now, uh, those of you who are familiar or have seen reinforced concrete beams under construction will note, however, that we also often have 
uh, steel running in the other direction. This is your transverse steel. And the purpose of this steel is to carry uh, shear forces and to bridge shear cracks that occur within concrete beams. So to see how this works, we need to consider, um, to see how shear, co uh, shear cracking works in concrete beams, we need to go back to that differential element. So consider the differential element that we talked about before, downward pointing arrow here, upward here, and then balancing uh, moments like this, as shown. Now, um, think about what's gonna happen for the deflected shape. Again, together it wants to uh, compress in this direction and pull apart in this direction. So we have a deflected shape like this. A deflected shape kind of like this. Now, again, this is greatly exaggerated, of course, but think about how this, if, if a crack were to form, or let's think about how this would affect crack development. So as this element is going from a square shape to a elongated uh, parallelogram-ish kind of shape, um, it's going to go like, it's going to want to stretch out like this, which means any material in the middle is going to want to pull apart, is going to want to separate. And this is where you get your, uh, this is how you get shear cracks in concrete. So if you have, a, again, this is drawn uh, from the left side of the beam. And so you would have uh, shear cracks in this direction, or more specifically, if here's your uh, simply supported beam, you would have shear cracks like this, like this, like this, or in the case of uh, something on the other side, if we considered an element on the other side, we would have shear cracking like this. In other words, the concrete is going to want to separate apart like this or like this, and that is, uh, and, and so you end up with uh, shear cracks. And the exact angle can vary somewhere between 30 and 45 degrees, but that is uh, the general direction that shear cracks will form in. And then we, uh, and so to address this, again, because this, it want, because this uh, shear forces wants to cause the uh, concrete to pull apart in shear, we need to add something for, to prevent that, uh, that pulling apart action. Because again, concrete has very little tensile capacity. So we add shear reinforcement to along certain locations in the reinforced concrete beam in order to provide a transverse reinforcement to prevent uh, shear cracking and the, uh, and the expansion of shear cracks in reinforced concrete beams. All right, that'll do it for today. Uh, that concludes our brief discussion of shear. Again, this is just meant to be a brief introduction to shear as a topic, integrating a few of the various uh, concepts that uh, arise out of statics and mechanics, which we will then be building up as we work towards our structural analysis techniques. So this is the really the second of three videos uh, introducing internal forces. The first one was our previous video on axial forces, and the next we'll be looking at moment. All right, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Uh, if you have any thoughts, feel free to share or questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, like, comment, subscribe to make the robots happy, etc. cetera. Uh, regardless, I hope to see you all again soon. Hope you found this uh, informative, or enjoyable, or at least a little bit, uh, a little bit revealing or refreshing, I suppose. Um, but regardless, I hope to see you all again soon. And as always, thank you.